Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 72 of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. My name is Mike, and that is Gavin. And Gavin, how many times have you coughed in the last 24 hours? Uh, not too many. What about you, Fia? Uh, not, not so much. What about you, Mike? A significant amount. I'm going to guess more than both of you combined. Oh, no. Yeah, I'd say that's, that's probably true. Yep. So yesterday, I, uh, I was waking up to go to school. And my throat felt a little scratchy. I'm like, yeah, I'm fine, but I've got a million COVID tests, so I'm going to try it out. Tested myself at 6.30 in the morning, came up positive. Yeah. And then just over the course of yesterday, it got rough. And then today, I've mostly felt better, but the uh, the coughing has been really tough. So, but I'm here, and I'm with two of my best good friends, and we're about to record a damn good podcast. So, I'm happy. Yeah, us too. Um, so... With that context, if Mike disappears, uh, it will not be like last episode where it was a tech thing. Uh, <laughs> this week, it will be him being a coffee mess, and he might, as he put it, Irish goodbye us, <laughs> and uh, Love just the Irish leave goodbye. without see, without saying anything, as one does in an Irish goodbye. Um, if you so didn't know, if Mike if Mike is no longer with us, uh, yeah, and Fia did not know. We had I, you had to put it like that. that if Mike is no longer <laughs> with us, I'm not that bad. <laughs> okay. If, if if you do not, if by episode seventy three, Mike, Mike still isn't here. <laughs> yeah, if if you don't hear Mike at any point in this episode, that is why. Uh, yeah. But we appreciate him roughing it out, throwing in some cough drops to be with us here today. Yes, and I am for the most like I you know in the grand scheme of things, like I'm fine. Nobody needs to worry about me. I will right. be just fine uh, from everything else once I uh, once I get a couple days to get over this. Absolutely. And so. With that, let's get into a little bit of the the meat, not the not the full entree of the episode, but some of the appetizers first. Appetizers today. <laughs> we're going to be talking. <laughs> yes, I, I <laughs> like that analogy. Anyway, uh, today we're going to be talking about the Devonian period. So we have been sort of systematically going through and talking about each of the periods of the relatively recent Earth history when there's been enough interesting paleontology things to talk about. Um, And we've worked through the Cambrian period in episode 50, the Ordovician period in episode 59, and the Silurian period in episode 66. And now, naturally, we're on to the one after the Silurian, the Devonian period, uh, which, in my humble opinion, uh, is arguably the most important geologic period of the last 538 million years. So I want to ask you why it's the most important, but I know we're going to get there. We sure will. Um, and so because of this, this might be a fairly long episode. You'll probably know that by the runtime of this episode, but we don't know that yet. Um, and so that's the topic for today. But before that, some quick announcements. Like usual, it would be a massive help if you could follow us on our various social medias on Twitter, Facebook, uh, YouTube as well. Um, interacting with us in the comments there is a great way to help support the podcast and support uh, the show. If you want to leave us a voice message and have that included uh, in an upcoming episode of the podcast, feel free to do that. Uh, there's links to that down below as well. All those things really help out the podcast and just make us feel good about ourselves. So um, with that, I think I want to throw it over to Mike for a Today in History. No. <laughs> okay. So uh, context here. I could blame COVID for this, but I'm not. As we were getting ready to record, Fia actually tossed out a great Today in History. She's like, Mike, I got something for you. And I said, this better than anything I got. The one thing that I came up with, we're not allowed to say on this podcast. So It was Sophia, a good one, but it's, it's not podcast. I mean, I wouldn't say not podcast appropriate, but not for today. Not for today. So um, Fia is going to be pulling double duty. Um, and that means I got to say duty, which I was happy about. But Fia, you've got your today in history. Yes, I what do. What do you got for us? I'm very excited about this one because I will be attending uh, – this thing, uh, this coming weekend. And this is going to be uh, the Brobridge Crawfish Festival, which happened the first week of May in 1960. So uh, the, I guess in 1959, the Louisiana legislature had named Brobridge the crawfish capital of the world. And so the following year, they decided to start a crawfish festival. And so that occurs uh, first full week of every May, and that happens to be this week. So this weekend, I will be going to the Crawfish Festival at Brobridge. 
Interesting. So for all of us non-swamp folk, where is that relative to like New Orleans? Oh, I have no idea. Uh, I think it's near, oh, okay. I think it's like south center of the state. Bro, okay. but yeah. Um, I'm assuming it's like you know south of the Mason Dixon line. It. <laughs> that's that's. I feel like that's pretty solid. Yeah. It's it's a yeah. it's a fair so statement. We, we're gonna start from there. It's north of the equator. Yeah. You're batting a thousand, <laughs> bud. Well, there we go. actually, it's like yeah, it's like pretty south center of the of the state, like a little north of New Orleans comparatively, but okay. still definitely on the south side. Sure. Cool. Um, but I was looking at the itinerary for this festival, and supposedly yeah. on Saturday they're having a crawfish race. Which I am stoked about. <laughs> I'm so excited. Um, if you get some kind of footage from that, can you send it to me? Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Potentially keep an eye out on our YouTube channel, another shameless plug, uh, that may end up on the YouTube channel. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. So bonus if content. See, if you see some bonus content without, I'm not going to put any context in that either. It's just going to be a video of crawfish racing. Yeah. Um, and it's going to be amazing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So awesome. excited. Awesome. Thank you for that. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. So with our Today in History and possible crawfish races to come, (laughs) uh, let's get into the episode. So like I said, the Devonian period is an incredibly important time in the history of life for a lot of reasons, particularly when considering like life as we know it today, because a lot of the way things are today first sort of show up during this time. And you can sort of say that about a lot of different periods where, you know, evolution's a constant process, right? So yeah. the closer we get to the recent, the more similar to today things are going to look. But it takes a big step during the Devonian period. And part of that is because the Devonian period is fairly long. Um, it is a, just over 60 million years long which is not the longest geologic period, but it's pretty close. It's, I think, like second or third. So mm-hmm. it's it's a fairly long time. Um, and, of course, as uh, many... Well, if you read the title of this episode, you probably know, it ends in a big old mass extinction. Again? Potentially two of them. We'll, we'll talk about it. Sweet. So... The Devonian period, like I said, lasts about 60 million years from 419.2 million years at the end of the Silurian period to 358.9 million years ago, which is the start of the Carboniferous period. And so that's a long time ago, right? But what was the Earth like back then? Generally, you can assume the farther, like I said, sort of conversely like to what I said earlier, The closer you get to today, the more familiar things look. The farther back you go, the more different and alien things look. And that definitely applies to not just the life, but sort of just the where things are on Earth as well. Because Earth looked real different at this point in time. So that makes sense. um, To start off with, sea levels were fairly high. Um, Not as high as they were way back in the Cambrian period, but... Uh, on average throughout the period, it was about 190 meters above modern day sea levels, or for us that use freedom units, uh, that would be about 623 feet. What so are you freedom live... units? <laughs> oh, fear. Amer- American fear. units. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know, we, I understand we, now. We love, we love our freedom. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> It's, it's okay. Um, but yeah, so if, if you live below 623 feet above sea level, which I'm sure Fia lives below that, and I currently also live yes. below that, uh, you would be living in the ocean. So that's very high. Um, however, but the, toward the end of the period, they would fall a bit to around 120 meters or just under 400 feet above uh, modern day sea levels. More on that later. Uh, sea level changes generally mean some funky stuff is going on climate-wise. Uh, hmm. The climate was generally pretty warm. I mean, that that's compared to today. Today, grand scheme of things, it is very cold on Earth these days. Uh, but back during the Devonian period, uh, it was quite warm. Not as warm as it would ever be, but on average, pretty warm. 
um, tropical sea surface temperatures would be around uh, 86 degrees Fahrenheit compared to around 61 degrees Fahrenheit today. So granted, you know, surface sea temperature is only one way to sort of talk about global temperatures, but if it's around 21 degrees in the water warmer, uh, or around 25 degrees warmer in the water, the land was much warmer than that. So it was at least 25 degrees warmer than it is today on average, uh, and the poles considerably were much warmer because they didn't have any ice. Hmm. Um, CO2 levels were fairly high. Um, we'll talk about that a heck of a lot more later. I'm assuming there's a relationship there between high CO2 levels and high temperature. There sure is, buddy, and we will... Okay. We, we sure will talk. We'll sure we'll talk about that. Um, I just want to point out the fact that Fia was the one that sneezed, there, not me. <laughs> I have allergies. Hey, sneezing, <laughs> sne sneezing is not a symptom of COVID. <laughs> hey, fair enough. I just wanted to just state for the record here that I doing fine. <laughs> I also had to mute myself earlier to cough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Whoops! Uh, during this time, no, that's okay. Uh, saves saves Mike or I some work later. Um, during this time, there's also lots of mountain building. So lots of continents crashing into each other and, and doing some weird things and creating lots of tall mountains. Uh, today, what we would know as North America collided what, uh, with what we would also call today as the Balkans, which is like Northern Europe, sort of Finland, Sweden, uh, that general area of Northern Europe. Uh, they collided uh, on sort of the Northeast coast. So basically from like, Maine or a little bit north of Maine and Canada down to probably around Virginia area is what that sort of covered and built up a lot of the hills and mountains and things that we see there today, uh, as well as a little more south, what today makes up the UK and some of the other British Isles um, also uh, crashed into sort of the southern eastern seaboard of uh, North America. So with all that combined, that created the sort of mini supercontinent of your America. We've okay. talked about that, I think, a little bit before. Um, one of the lesser known supercontinents, not quite Pangaea. We'll, we will get to Pangaea soon, uh, but not quite yet. And because of this, uh, with sea levels being so high and some of these funky tectonic things going on with uh, all the different, you know, uh, tectonic plates, it created a lot of... Uh, really shallow seaways on what are like what would normally be continental crust but covered in water we've talked about that a little bit before um but basically everything from uh like basically western new york western pennsylvania and a strip sort of that um direction all the way sort of south a little bit west was covered in uh, a very shallow ocean, as well as things like Michigan was completely covered by a shallow ocean, Illinois, and um, like I said, that stretch from Georgia uh, all the way up to like central-ish New York. And, oh, my dog found one of her toys. Nice. Uh, <laughs> um, this also created uh, a really, really big island in the middle of that seaway in uh, like the sort of like central eastern United States, like this really skinny but really long island that was about a thousand miles long and it stretched from like northern Ohio all the way down to like central Alabama, Mississippi. Whoa. That's yeah. pretty big. Um, yeah. And then on the eastern side of this, so what we would now call today a lot of like the very, very eastern stretches of the Appalachians, uh, those were, that was where these mountains were being built. And so we see that a lot today and uh, a lot of sediment from this time period uh, eroded down from those mountains into this really shallow seaway. Because, you know, when sediment erodes, it gets washed downward into these basins. And so a lot of the Devonian age rocks in like New York and, and Pennsylvania come from these old, old mountains. Oh, I always wondered which ones they were, they came from in yeah. New York. Yeah. And so, uh, meanwhile, in the other smaller supercontinent, Gondwana, which we've talked about quite a bit, but this is uh, the supergroup of all the other continents. So basically, 
South America, Africa, India, Australia, and Antarctica. They were all combined into one giant supercontinent that had been together for, at this point, a few hundred million years. So these continents have been together for a long time. Um, I have a question about these supercontinents. Yeah. Is it just like a an inevitability of the randomness of plate tectonics that we had these, you know, mini supercontinents and then Pangaea and other times when all the continents were put together? Or is there something significant about the fact that certain continents were smushed together at certain times? Like basically what I'm asking, is that random or is there something more significant than that? Um, I wouldn't quite call it random because it is predictable. Okay. Like we know which way the continents are moving today. And based on, you know, we, you know, we've had a whole episode about plate tectonics, but, um, it's like, we, we can tell which ways the continents move and just through some general physics, we don't understand everything about how they move. Um, but through things like fossils, we can tell, okay, these continents were together. And based on how old these fossils are, we know this continent was touching this continent at this time. And so we can model backward through time to sort of figure that out. And then based on our knowledge of how they got to where they were to where they are, we can sort of model where they're going to go in the future. Okay. So it's, um, it, it's not random, it's predictable, but like there's nothing significant about these particular continents being you know together at this particular time it's just the way it happened to be yeah pretty much okay uh but yeah gondwana was mostly southern just as all of those continents pretty much are now um but it was starting to inch a bit north because uh as i mentioned i think during our episode about the ordovician period um gondwana was not quite centered but very heavily down on the south pole and so throughout the Silurian period, as well as now into the Devonian period, it's been inching more north toward the equator, uh, where it starts to uh, shake hands with your America and would not quite form Pangaea, but in probably a couple dozen million years after this, Pangaea would be fully formed. But Pangaea's, you know, when, when all of the continents come together to form the continental megazord, uh, they a lot of things have to line up for that to happen, and life doesn't always like that. Uh, so that potentially has some effects that we're going to talk about a little bit later. And uh, speaking of, you know, all of those warm, shallow oceans, a lot of that happens to be really good for life, as we have talked about, particularly if you are a marine invertebrate. Hooray! I know, I was, I was waiting for Pete to say something. <laughs> we love if, those. <laughs> exactly. If you are a marine invertebrate, you love shallow epicontinental seas. Those are real great for you because you get lots of, you know, the, the things that you filter out of the water, which would be mostly like um, photosynthetic algae, other single-celled things like that, or smaller multi-celled things. Um, they really like a lot of nutrients in the water. Not too many, but enough to keep them their, their numbers up. And if you're a little filter-feeding uh, invertebrate, you want those to be happy because then you're happy. And so when the oceans are warm and shallow, uh, all the nice photosynthesizing things in the water are nice and happy, and therefore you're happy. So from what I could find, this was pretty much the all-time high for reef ecosystems. There are fossils of, you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles long of reefs where it's like, we'll find, you know, a, a reef in like a, the same layer of sediment in Southern Pennsylvania as we will in, you know, central New York. Huh. One single contiguous reef that entire way. And That's I'm just using huge. that as an example. Yeah. I don't know for sure that those two places specifically but i know uh, there is one i believe in australia that is you know a couple hundred miles long yeah you're talking about the so, great barrier reef or like no pat like past For, reef way past way past Got it. during during this time here yeah so australia just happens to be a pretty good place for reefs in general <laughs> i guess um but yeah, so 
reefs were being built by things differently than we sort of see them being built today. Today they're built by um, by valves, among other things. Um, but when you were thinking of a reef, you were probably thinking of coral reefs. And that was a major part of these reefs, but not quite the same corals. Uh, today we have mostly scleractinian corals, or stony corals as they're often called. Uh, those were around, but definitely not the major players. The major players were the tabulate corals and the rugosin corals. Uh, they just sort of build their reefs differently. They build their calcareous skeleton differently. Uh, rugosin corals are almost entirely solitary. So they are commonly called horn corals because their skeleton looks like uh, like a cow's horn or something right. and, and big enough to fit in your hand like a cow's horn, unlike the corals that we have today that are mostly microscopic. Like a singular coral uh, is that big? Mm-hmm. Whoa. Yeah. And so, uh, among other things, building these reefs were sponges, uh, specifically a group of sponges called stromatoporoids, which I think is just a very fun name. Um, <laughs> they, uh, those two in particular are really big reef builders at this time, um, but they sort of alternated because as, as it always says, the climate is always fluctuating a bit. And so it appears that in times that it was a little bit cooler was when the sponges and the corals were doing most of the reef building. When it got a little too warm for them, uh, it was actually a lot more algae that were building the reefs, which is really interesting because we don't see that pretty much anywhere today. They're definitely part of the environment, um, but not like the main reef builders pretty much anywhere today, which is interesting. Uh, but, you know, there's more living out a reef than just the things building the reef. So we have lots of things like crinoids, uh, which we've talked about before. There will be an episode on them eventually because they're really neat. But they're basically a starfish upside down on a stalk. And their, like, five arms have, like, feathery tentacles sort of coming off of them that they use to snatch food from the water. Really neat, really diverse group. Still around today, uh, but much, much less diverse than they used to be. But they were doing great at this at these times. Trilobites, the little uh, old timey sea bugs, were still hanging on, not doing too great. They were really at their peak in the Cambrian and the uh, Ordovician periods. But by this point, they'd gone through a mass extinction and were not doing great by this point. But they were still around. Uh, Brachiopods, episode sixty eight, uh, were also doing great, having a great time. Um, brachiopods, or I'm, I'm sorry, bivalves. So even I get those confused sometimes. Uh, bivalves were, again, around, but not a major part of ecosystems yet. But they were, you know, doing their bivalve thing. Not uh, building reefs per se yet, as, as they do sometime uh, today and sometime later or earlier in the Cretaceous period. But what really takes off in the Devonian are all the things actually swimming around in the water. Uh mostly a lot of predatory things. Uh, this is when the first aminoids show up. Uh, they are sort of, as we've called them, the squirrely shelled squid boys. Oh, I love those. Mm -hmm. we've, we've had other cephalopods swimming around in the water at this point, uh, but those have been mostly nautiloids uh, and mostly the straight shelled ones. Um, very much, very often called uh, like orthocone shaped uh where it's instead of being coral it's just a long cone like a, imagine a very skinny ice cream cone with the squid coming out of the front of the cone uh so, aminoids oh go ahead oh yeah i think i was just about to ask what the difference were between aminoids and um the other ones nautiloids yeah so there are some nautiloids you know including uh the chambered nautilus that we still have today the only like externally shelled cephalopod that we still have today um has a curled shell but they curl them sort of differently um yeah it's just it's just sort of the structure of the shell is the main thing uh and if i remember correctly aminoids evolved from uh nautiloids oh okay so yeah so they just started swirling their shells a little differently and uh connecting the different chambers together a little differently and, and more intricately i think aminoids did got it uh, but cool. um it, yeah especially among invertebrates my cephalopod group knowledge is not great uh, yeah. 
So don't don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure that's right. Okay. Um. But uh, yeah, they first show up, and they show up, uh, like I said, in this time period, and go on to be a huge, huge part of ocean ecosystems later down the line. But this is when they first show up, and the Devonian also has a very fun colloquial name, which is the Age of Fishes. Hooray. There are a yeah, it's for, <laughs> for me as a vertebrate person, this is a real good time. Uh, so the yeah. Devonian period, a lot of major fish groups show up during this time. Uh, specifically, the jawed fishes. Um, there's a couple groups of uh, agnathans, which is the jawless fishes still around today. Um, those would be your lamprey and your hagfish, which like they're they're still vertebrates. They they look a lot like uh like leeches or something and lampreys specifically sort of function kind of like leeches they're but, so scary uh, yeah i highly uh, suggest are... uh googling pictures of those very scary yeah mm-hmm. uh but they they are vertebrates but they are jawless fishes they do not have a functional like bony jaw like you think of a fish having uh but jawed fishes first show up in the probably like late Silurian period, potentially the Ordovician period. My recollection on that's a little foggy, but they first like get real diverse and important here in the Devonian period. Uh, specifically, we're going to break it down into the three sort of large scale groups of jawed fishes. First, we have the placoderms. Uh, you'll often hear these called the armored fish. Their name means plated skin. Um, and for these, we don't have them around anymore. So basically imagine sort of a, a shark-like body from the front fins back. But basically the head region is covered in these plates of bone armor, including their jaws. So their jaw is a single bone without teeth for the most part, but they have these big spikes of bone that act like teeth. Wow. So it ba basically Spikes imagine... Spikes of bone that act like teeth? Yeah. So basically imagine so if you... Hold on. Go ahead. Go ahead. Like, it, isn't that just teeth? Like, aren't just <laughs> teeth bones? Yes, but this was a single piece of bone. So imagine if you just had like a bear trap for a lower jaw. <laughs> a, a single okay. contiguous piece instead of the piece and then all the bony bits on top that are teeth. I yeah, see. that's okay. Understood now. Yep. And so their jaws basically behaved like scissors because their top jaw was also like that. So they were just very spiked and they closed in on each other. Basically, you know, like, like a bear trap, how that sort of hits itself that, but if the bottom one was just a little offset, so they went a little past each other when they closed yeah. that were, that was placoderms. And so their head, like I said, happen. was very armored. Oh, go ahead. Um, I wonder what would happen if they like chipped a tooth or something like did they just like over time like just have no teeth or I guess have no bone? <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure because there are definitely fossils of uh, especially some of the bigger ones that I'll talk about here in a sec um, that have wounds that it's like, well, there's only one other thing as big as this thing and it's itself. Uh <laughs> So it's like these wounds must have come from another big placoderm. Yeah. And it's like if it's, you know, hard enough to chomp down on the bony armor, it probably the bony armor is probably hard enough to chip it back, you know. Right. Yeah. So I haven't really seen anything about that though. I really even heard that talked about. So I'm not I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh but these were a a big big deal group during the Devonian period. Um if you look at this group, I'm sure the first one that you will find is the biggest one because it always is. <laughs> um, and so you will typically, if you look up this group, find a genus called Dunkleosteus, which got to about great white shark size, 20 to 25 ish feet. So big, big, big fish. Um, and in a lot of the older, uh, you know, depictions of these, the armor will be exposed so it'll look like just like a chunky shark from, like I said, those those front fins back and then just have a bony plate covered head. We don't really think that anymore. We think that those bones probably were covered in some kind of skin. Um, but, you know, it's, they're 
a lot more fun to look at when they're it's just the bony armor exposed so you'll probably still see them depicted like that sometimes so this was the main group especially in the early to middle devonian uh, of predatory fish but they were not the only ones uh the first sharks sort of show up in the devonian period uh you'll remember from episode uh episode 31 that's our shark episode uh our shark week episode actually from last year um where we talked about sharks that they probably evolved from a group of uh animals often called the spiny sharks very misleading name because they're not actually sharks um they're a group called the acanthodians that are very shark like but also have a lot of like bony fish like traits um but the Acanthodians were also very common during this time period, and from them, the first sharks and shark cousins uh, evolved as well. So they were doing important things here. Um, but the big one, particularly going forward in, uh, in time after the Devonian, are the Osteichthians, which are the bony fish. If you are thinking of a fish, it is almost certainly a bony fish. This is everything from your perch, your sturgeon, your uh, lungfish, ev- pretty much everything you're thinking of as, as, as a fish is an osteichthian. And they very early in the Devonian period split into the two large scale groups that we still have today, which are the Actinopterygii and the Sarcopterygii. Um, the, we'll, we'll talk more about them in a little bit. Um, but despite their modern diversities, basically, if you're thinking of a fish, it is an actinopterygii. Those are the ray-finned fishes. Oh, yeah. The kind where it's like, yeah, their fin is, like, connected to the body, but it's mostly just, like, a little, like, thin, mostly, like, like transparent a lot of times, flap of skin with some, like, rays in it. That's where they get the name from. Uh, whereas the lobe-finned fish, the sarcopterygians, um, have a more, like, fleshy very much limb looking spoilers um lump of flesh in their uh in their fins especially the front fins this is what like the coelacanth is if you look at a coelacanth fin they don't look like other fish fins because they have just sort of an oval shaped lump for a fin and then they have the rays sort of along the outside of uh of that uh lump of flesh huh so today the ray finned fish are much, much, much more common, like 30,000 species common <laughs> relative to Sarcopterygians, which I'm like, I, I think, depending on how you count them, are less than like 10 species. Wow, that's a big difference. Leaving out, leaving out some things that I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but yeah, there's two species of coelacanth and a couple of species of lungfish, and that's all we have left today. But back during the Devonian, it was the complete opposite. The lobe-finned fish were everywhere, and the ray-finned fish were not as common yet. And from those lobe-finned fish, we get a few very special ones who really decided to work on their upper body strength. <laughs> more, more on them in a little bit. Okay. But what the Devonian period is really well known for is the development of life on land. In our episode about the Silurian period, episode 66, I mentioned... Have we not had life on land yet? We have a bit, but not the way you're thinking of it. Uh, If you think back to last episode about plants, we talked about, uh, again, as as I mentioned in the the last episode, uh, an absurdly, insultingly brief history of you know, plants, it was during the Devonian period where plants really got going on land. They had been up there for a a while, but hadn't really started doing big things or especially things that we would really recognize until the Devonian period. So, um, a lot of different groups had sort of the opposite of dipped their toe in the water, dipped their, (laughs) dipped their foot in the air, I guess, uh, during, potentially the late Cambrian period, but definitely through the Ordovician and Silurian periods. Um, But up until this point, it was pretty much all arthropods. Uh, Things like your myriapods, which are your centipedes and millipedes, 
they'd been doing some things on land. Your arachnoids, you know, the larger group that inc- that includes spiders uh, and and scorpions and their cousins, um, and hexapods, which is the larger group that includes insects. They had been up on land pretty early, like late Ordovician, definitely into the Silurian period. And by the Devonian, they had pretty complex ecosystems going on up on land, uh, particularly by the Middle Devonian, because that's when plants really started doing stuff on land. Um, they, uh, you know, the first true insects first appear in the Devonian and insects generally have a really complex relationship with plants. Um, by the middle Devonian, we would have a lot of, you know, things that you would definitely recognize as insects. Um, modern quote unquote groups like scorpions. By this point, we're already doing great and doing things on land. You would see that and be like, that's definitely a scorpion. You know, it had, you know, the pincers and the singer and everything. Um, (laughs) But around the middle Devonian, they got some new friends to play with. And those are? A very special group of those Sarcopterygian fish that are fairly closely related to today's lungfish started to adapt a bit to living on land. And we will have a dedicated episode to this at some point soon. Um, it's it's on it's on our list of things to do. So I won't go into a ton of details about how it happened here. And it's going to sound like they poked their eyes up, saw those bugs, and were like, man, those look tasty. Uh, but that's not really how it happened. Um, <laughs> that's often how that's often how it's framed. Like they were like, hey, that's a cool spot. I want to be up there, and then just went there. But there were lots and lots of different groups of uh, limbed fish that were perfectly content still living in the water. Limbs are just a generally helpful thing to have. If you live in really shallow water, but you still want to breathe water, if you still hunt and do stuff in the water, but, you know, it's not limbs to crawl around with are a lot easier than a big tail to paddle around with if you're only in, you know, like a couple feet of water. So, like I said, won't go into a ton of detail on it here, but over the course of 20, 25-ish million years in the early to middle Devonian, this group of fish acquired the traits that helped them adapt to land to at least a, to at least a more terrestrial lifestyle than just regular fish. Traits that are things like eyes sort of on the top of their head. If you look at like a fish, they have eyes basically on the exact sides of their heads whereas these ones had them more on the top so they could see up out of water. Uh, Their eyes, for that reason, adapted, you know, clearly uh, to be able to see at least decently in air because light works differently in air versus water. So your eyes Mm -hmm. need to adapt for that change. Uh, They grew necks because fish don't really have necks. (laughs) I guess they don't. I never thought about that. Yeah, so their their shoulder bones, or what in tetrapods, things with limbs, uh, what became their shoulder bones, are attached to their head. So if you look at a fish skull, uh, that includes the bones that uh, make up the, those front pectoral fins. Those are attached. So in these fish, they became detached, so they actually had a neck and shoulders and actual limb bones. Um they gained obviously much, much more robust limb bones and musculature to be able to paddle around and do stuff like that with limbs. And I really want to stress that these were still aquatic. It's not like those fish popped their head up and just waltzed onto land. This was a very ongoing, like I said, 20, 25 million year project for them to then be able to go on land if they needed to. Whereas like, oh, this, you know, river that I'm in, is drying up. I want to go to that one over there. I'm going to plod across the land awkwardly and then be able to hang out as a fish over there. (laughs) So uh, there were lots of them, lots of them that were still perfectly content living in the water. So it's not like it was this eventual march onto land. And by the end of the Devonian period, there were some that were, like probably like passable on land, still really awkward on land, but they still had lots of fishy features, like a tail that's really keeled so they could swim with it 
Um, a lot of them still had gills by this point too, gills and lungs, which is pretty convenient to have. Um, but they were well on their way to becoming more or less something that you would call a big old salamander today. Gotcha. In fact, they probably functioned a lot like giant sized, like, uh, newts, like the fully aquatic salamanders. They probably functioned a lot like just giant those. Okay. Okay. Um, and lastly, you talked about things on land. Uh, I, I don't want to skip over the plants. Last episode's research has <laughs> given me a new appreciation for them. Um, so, That's yeah, animals animals weren't the only things making big, big steps. Literally. Um, <laughs> but as I mentioned last episode, plants had been on land for quite a while by the Devonian. But here's when we see a lot of their major innovations. We see the first soils produced by plants. Up until this point, it was just like whatever sediment happened to be there is what they grew on. But by this point, there had been enough things living and then dying and being decomposed on the <laughs> land to form like an actual soil. Which cool. is, ve- yeah, that's very weird to think about. But having soils on your land is a major chemical change to the environment. Yeah. Because that keeps a lot of chemicals that would normally just be washed away whenever it rains. It, ke- it You know, and those go into a lake or back into the ocean or whatever. Uh, those stay on the land. And because there was an actual soil for them to grow into, a lot of plants at this point started growing the first like real roots. Because things like mosses yeah. don't really have roots, per se. They have things that sort of stick them to whatever they're growing on, but they're not roots in the way that you would normally think of them. For plant reasons that I don't fully understand. Uh, so plant reasons. We, yeah plant reasons uh so we we see the first roots and uh we also see you know now that they have a solid anchor in these roots plants start to grow a bit taller we see the first um things like the first wood around this time which means we have the first shrubs and trees during this time we see the first seeds during this time especially that's the first seeds came a little bit later more toward the end of the uh the devonian But that's, the seeds, like we mentioned, uh, I think last episode, those allow you to sort of pick up the water and take it with you, more or less. Yeah. And so that allowed plants to get to places that they couldn't have before. So places that were previously just barren rock or just moss-covered rock, they could throw their seeds up there and, you know, now that they don't need water for that to happen, those can just grow much more easily than they could before seeds evolved. So plants begin to spread much more quickly than they had before. Cool. Um, I mentioned before that this is when we see the first wood. Wood is made of a very particular compound called lignin. And that is very important when we get to the Carboniferous period. But lignin is very rich in carbon. You need a lot of carbon to build lignin. That becomes very important in the Carboniferous and pretty important later on in this episode when we get to some of the extinction-y things. And uh, lastly, all of these plants, as well as these soils, um, hold a lot of the sediment where it is. If If you've ever seen like a river, you know, rivers don't like to flow through plants you know, if there's a river where there's a lot of trees on the banks, that river's not really going anywhere. That river's not going to erode a new channel, typically, because those roots do a really good job of holding the sediment where it is. Yes. And so that generally means less nutrients and stuff downstream, and the ultimate downstream, which is the ocean. Yeah. So that is uh, a lot of the things going on on land. So like I said, this was very important for life as we know it today, but sadly, things were not meant to be all, all nice and peachy keen for, uh, for all that long, as they, they never do. And at the end of the Devonian period, we see one of the traditional, quote, big five mass extinctions. And this one is really complicated, 
because when it was first sort of named, we didn't have good resolution. We, we knew that something happened, but as per usual, we didn't know what or why. We just knew, hey, a lot of stuff that was here before is no longer here. Um, so it is included in the traditional big five mass extinctions, even though by most estimates that I've seen or most like hypotheses, most of the data that we have today, it actually appears to be two different events. Hmm. So uh, we'll talk about them a bit in a, in a little bit, but first I want to talk about what the extinction, what both of them in total did. So from the start of the late Devonian, about 382 million years ago to the end of the Devonian period in general, which is 358 million years. So that is, you know, a course of uh, about 24 million years. Hmm. We see at least 75% of all species go extinct. Ouch. Yeah. And that is typically what would have caused this to be called one of the big five mass extinctions because you just see that 75% number and before we had good enough resolution on it we were like wow that sure seems like a lot yeah but contextualized that's over the course of 25 million years which is in terms of of mass extinctions that's a for in terms of mass extinctions that's a really long time oh okay Mass extinctions generally take place over a few hundred thousand years, maybe a couple million, not 24, 25 million. So who thought it was a good idea to just be like, this is just one big thing? Like I said, back when we noticed all of these things going extinct, um, we, we didn't have enough data enough resolution in the data to, to see that these were two events. So based on the data that they had at the time, I see. this looked like it, it was all one thing. Okay. That's fair. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's science. That's how yeah. science works. So you get more data. Sometimes your interpretation of things change. Right. Um, but um, it was also something that a couple of the articles that I read meant you know made made a specific point like kind of went out of their way to point out that this in general both of these extinctions this general event um appears to be more impacted by sampling bias than some of the other extinctions meaning that uh either we don't have great rocks from this time or the rocks that we have are only representative of certain environments um so that 75 percent may or may not be super confident but most things will generally agree based on the data we have 75 percent got it um also like i said throughout those 25 million years 97 percent of all vertebrate species go extinct which is a lot (laughs) yeah so i'm sorry maybe i missed it did we does anybody know why we will get there. Okay. All right. Be- because it is the two events, I want to talk about just in general, this, the late Devonian time first, okay. and then we'll get into some of the weeds about the, the separate events and what sort of happened. Okay. Um, but yeah, 97% of all vertebrate species go extinct. Uh, those placoderms, those cool armored fish, those are completely gone by the end of the Devonian period. Um, and all fish took a pretty big hit. But the Sarcopterygians, the lobe-finned fish, took a really big hit. Um, they were basically reduced to the main groups that we have today, which would be the coelacanths and their relatives, and the lungfish and their relatives. There were a couple stragglers, but those were pretty much all we had left. Um, as well as those ones that decided to invent leg day. Um, <laughs> in general, and this this is a very common theme with pretty much every mass extinction but and i'm sure fia will be very sad to hear this mm. benthic invertebrates do real bad <laughs> no my heart so be- benthic meaning you know spe- spending pretty much all of their time on the sea floor instead of you know up in the water um they do real bad particularly the ones that can't move 
Um, so all of the reefs, episode 34 featuring Fia, um, <laughs> reefs in general do real bad. The corals do awful. <laughs> we do not see corals really recover until the Mesozoic. So at least another hundred ish million years. Um, the sponges, those stromatoporoids that were a big part of building up the reefs, those go extinct. We do not see those after the Devonian period. Uh, brachiopods, episode 68, do also real bad. Similar to, you know, like I said, they can't move. They move even less than bivalves do, and a lot of bivalves are not particularly good at moving. Um, but for some reason, a couple of things that I found basically said that bryozoans seem to do fine. Which is really weird, because they also can't move, and they feed basically the same way that uh, brachiopods do. But for some reason, they pretty much did fine. Hmm. Um, and bivalves also seem to do fine. Hooray! I did not see a particular reason for either of those, but they seem to do pretty okay. Right. Um... Swimming things also didn't do particularly well, but we're not as hardly hit. Um, trilobites, some some of them could swim. Uh, some were, you know, still stuck uh, in in the benthos on on the like sea surface. Um, they do real bad. Of course, they've been sort of on the decline for at this point like a hundred million years. So um, this just furthers their decline. Uh, Aminoids, those swirly shelled squid boys, they do horrible uh, i think i saw somewhere that like only like 12 genera survived wow. and granted they go on to flourish after this they do amazing after the extinction but they were really close to being completely gone yeah they almost didn't make it yeah and they and which is weird because they're so iconic of oh, a lot yeah. of especially like cretaceous age stuff super iconic uh, but they were really close to just completely getting Thanos snapped. And so mm. now we get into a little bit of the causes here. Um, the causes are a bit different between the two uh, events, but sort of the ocean chemistry things that they did were somewhat similar. So we'll talk about some of the chemistry stuff. Um, I'm not a chemist. Disclosure here. Um, so generally the big killer was low oxygen in the water. That one seems fairly obvious why that's not great. Things need oxygen. Anoxia is... Exactly. Yeah. So ocean anoxia, particularly along the seafloor, which is why all of those, you know, benthic things did not do well. Um, ocean anoxia is really bad, but when it's combined with sulfur to create a condition called euxinia, that is also really bad. Sulfur is generally poisonous to a lot of things, and it creates uh, sulfuric acid and is not good for things that make their bodies out of calcium carbonate. Um, not because like the acid like dissolves their shells, but because it just like interrupts the chemical process that they use to make their skeletons. It just generally makes it harder for them to do that. Mm. So it just generally gives them stresses. I've never heard of that otherwise have. Yeah. Eucinia, I've never heard of that. Yep. Yeah, that's that only happens when things get real bad. <laughs> um, yeah, I see. Um, and another thing was generally higher nutrients in the water causing things like algal blooms in some of those shallow seaways. So I mentioned earlier that plants will sort of bind up a lot of sediment, which is true. But if there's a lot more living on land and therefore dying on land, that's a lot of new introduction of material. Of a lot of plants just being washed down these rivers into the ocean. If there's a lot more plants, that just means there's a lot more nutrients to be taken up. And as I'm sure Fia can attest to, algal blooms are absolutely devastating. Yes. To shallow, especially shallow water environments. Right. They basically know, create maybe... like a cover over the top of the water. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And then the algal blooms, you would think might counteract some of that um, anoxia, you know, algae make oxygen. They're photosynthetic, right? But no, they basically, because they also need oxygen, they choke off everything else in the environment. 
don't they like if they're producing oxygen i thought maybe I, this is just something i heard but they release the oxygen into the air and not the water mm-hmm. yeah. yeah that's a big part of it gotcha so that's um, why mm-hmm. and then with the continents moving around so much this also created uh some weird fluctuations in ocean currents so they weren't you know, uh, flowing and any change to ocean currents is generally pretty bad for life because that's what they're used to. Uh, and so changing ocean currents means changing in, you know, nutrient cycling changes in ocean water temperatures and, uh, changes in things like oxygen. So all all these things sort of cascaded together to, generally make a hard time for things in the ocean. So those are the things that like directly would kill the animals, but what caused those? So it's, it's easy to see how no oxygen in the water is bad, but what makes it so there's no oxygen in the water? We've talked a bit about like, like those algal blooms and things like that, but there's also things that in general, you know, you don't get a mass extinction just from some algal blooms. Volcanism is often pointed to with mass extinctions. Um, we don't see a ton of it, not as much as there is during other time periods where there's mass extinctions, but we do see some. Um, but because the volcanism doesn't seem like it's enough to explain these mass extinctions, some other ideas have been thrown out. Um, there's been a hypothesis that there was a supernova relatively nearby. Hmm. And that fried some of the ozone in the atmos- atmosphere. And that increased UV radiation, and for reasons that were not adequately explained, um, that was, I mean, obviously, increase in UV is not good, um, but that was probably just, like, an extra stress on top of the algal blooms, on top of, you know, the anoxia, stuff like that. Uh, That's, I don't like that, because there's no way to prove that, right? There's, what evidence... Is there for that? Yeah. That, that you could find in fossils? There, there really isn't any. Um, it's been suggested that there was uh, a meteor impact. And there has been a crater found from around this time that's fairly big. So that probably didn't help matters. Not nearly as big as the one at the end of the Cretaceous period, but mm-hmm. still, you know, decent size. Um, so again, probably just didn't help. <laughs> Um, so a lot of the, the causes are a little dubious. Um, and then I also put in my notes here, life getting too confident <laughs> as a potential cause. And I'll elaborate more on that in a little bit, but it boils down to too many plants causing that eutrophication, which is what causes those algal blooms as well as life lowering CO2 globally. We mentioned earlier mm. that this was a time of generally really high CO2. So they just got too good. They got too good. And I'll talk about that in just a second. So, yeah. So I mentioned before that we sort of recognize this now as two different events. And so I'm going to talk about those in just a little bit of detail, you know, without getting too much in the weeds. We're already uh, a little long. So uh, without going into too much detail here. But so the first one is uh, around... 372 million years ago, this was called the Kelwasser event based on, you know, the location that it was sort of first observed in, in Germany. Hmm. So it seems like most things that like reference the end Devonian mass extinction are referring to this one of the two, but there's still a bit of debate about it. So this is the one where it's like the causes are a little dubious on the second one. The cause is fairly explicit. Um, but this is the one that like, we're not exactly sure. And that's even sort of led some people to argue that this wasn't an extinction event per se, that instead it was a biodiversity crisis. And those sounds like (laughs) similar things, but there's an important difference. So it's been argued that this was not a time of increased extinction, that extinction rates were basically the normal background, because there's always a background extinction rate. Mm 
but instead that this was a time of really low speciation. So not low extinction, or not really high extinctions, but a time of really low new species evolving. And so people have sort of attributed that to a time of really high invasive species. Mm. With the continents coming together, that introduces a lot of new species to each other that wouldn't have been together before this. And so if there's a handful that are maybe a little better adapted for this ocean anoxia that was happening at this time, they could essentially take over the world. Well, so they just happened to push out the other things that were going extinct otherwise. And because they were really good at it, they didn't have a lot of selective pressure to, uh, you know, adapt and evolve into new species. And this is sort of the natural conclusion of a, an incredibly interconnected world. We're seeing this a lot today, sort of the, the natural conclusion of what humans do with invasive species is that every island is going to be covered in cats and dogs and pigeons and rats and things. And it's, it's just going to be overall lower diversity, maybe not lower like biomass per se. So same amount of organisms, but a handful of organisms that are just real good at doing this thing in relatively low oxygen where the others were not. Right. So that is, like I said, some people have proposed that. Other people said that that hypothesis has problems. Like I said, this particular, the first of the two, it appears that a lot of stuff went extinct, but people have sort of brought up issues with that. T time will tell. We will see. Maybe there'll be a follow-up in, you know, a couple years. Then we get to the second of the two, which happened at the very end of the Devonian period, uh, 359 million years ago. Uh, and this one is called the Hangenberg event. Much more fun name. Um, yeah. <laughs> and this one uh, is what you would typically think of with a mass extinction. It lasted a, maybe a couple hundred thousand years Anywhere from 31 to 50-ish uh, percent of genera went extinct. So that, you know, if that's the genera level, a lot more species than that went extinct. Um, and unlike the first one, the, the, the first one only seemed to affect uh, marine environments. This one appears to have at least done a bit of damage to things on land as well. Hmm. Um. And that is because this one, from what we can tell, is pretty easily attributed to a very large glacial event. Oh. Likely from a variety of reasons, but a big part of it is that low atmospheric CO2 caused by, among other things, uh, plants, like I said, getting a little too confident in themselves. Um, <laughs> if plants grow and spread, it's like, well, the majority of the continents were not covered in you know, macro plants. They might have had like a, a film of photosynthetic algae on them before this, but it was during this time where plants really spread. And if you have that much significant plant growth in that short amount of time, that is going to decimate the amount of atmospheric CO2 that there is. Hmm. And so with that, like I said, lignin is really important because it was a brand new compound that had never been seen before in the world. And none of the decomposers knew how to break it down. So it was not getting recycled. Oh. Meaning that it was just getting buried as more or less pure carbon. So that was, that was carbon that was not making it back into the atmosphere. So all of that carbon was just being sucked up by the plants and then not being broken down as it normally would if there were things to decompose the lignin. Um... And that was just sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere. Another thing that, um, you know, sucks uh, CO2 out of the atmosphere is weathering. Weathering of rocks. And plants covering rocks generally uh, leads to a lower amount of that. But, circling way back to the beginning, this was such a time of extreme mountain building building up mountains leads to a lot more erosion and weathering. And so that also probably sucked a bunch of CO2 out of the atmosphere as well. And because of that, and because Wait. Gondwana was still pretty far South, uh, that just 
drop temperatures and made a bunch of glaciers. Um, could you go over how weathering, just very generally, how weathering yeah, uh, yeah releases carbon you said, into the atmosphere? So, so it, it absorbs carbon. Oh, absorbs carbon. Um, yeah, so generally, um, the weathering of silicate rocks, so um, things like feldspars, um, quartzes, things like that, produce clay minerals. And when some of their chemical bonds are broken, mm -hmm. they, for chemistry reasons, again, as I said earlier, I'm not a chemist, mm -hmm. um, part of that chemical reaction absorbs carbon dioxide. Um, very frequent, very frequently when things weather, they weather to what are called clay minerals. Um, and they're called that because a, they make up most things that you would call clay. Um, but they have very flat chemical structures. Whereas you think of, you know, like the chemical structure for quartz is a single, uh, silica atom with sort of a pyramid almost, of oxygen atoms around it. Oh, okay. Um, whereas clay minerals are basically structured in a very flat sheet. Mm -hmm. But in order to break all those bonds and then form the new ones as the clay minerals, they need carbon really helps with that structural transition from one structural shape to another. I see. A lot of inorganic chemistry things that I don't particularly understand well, but yeah. it, is very, it is very well documented that this chemical reaction happens. Okay, cool. Um, so between all the plants sucking up the carbon dioxide and uh, increased weathering, uh, carbon dioxide got sucked out of the atmosphere like boba. And <laughs> uh, because of that, made some big old glaciers on Gondwana. And any time that global temperatures change, plus or minus in that short of a time, it's generally not great for life <clears throat> humans. Um, <laughs> and so wrapping up my part here before we get into uh, the swamp corner, uh, let's talk about a little bit about what happens after the extinction, because uh, we'll have an entire episode about the Carboniferous period, which is the period after this eventually, but um, just to sort of make this a rounded, wholesome Devonian period episode. So, uh, starting out with my bias, our lineage of tetrapods, you know, vertebrates with limbs, um, appears to be the only one left. Before, there were multiple lineages that, you know, like I said, it wasn't just one group of fish that came up and did it. It was a, a group of them that were all doing these tetrapod-like things at the same time. This was just a decent way to live in swampy or, or shallow environments. Um, ours appears to be the only one left. Uh, because before the extinctions, these tetrapods had a variety of numbers of digits. Seeing these, you know, early tetrapods with seven, eight digits on a hand was not uncommon. Whoa. A lot of them had. Yeah. But That'd be after so the extinctions. Cool. Yeah, right? Uh, uh, after the extinctions, uh, we see at most five, which is the maximum uh, number of digits that tetrapods have on a limb today. Now I can only uh, think I, about myself having, like, seven fingers. <laughs> right? That would change just so many things fundamentally about, like, human society. Oh, yeah. Uh, would the metric system be base 14 if we had seven? <laughs> Weird. Maybe. <laughs> um, so, uh, brachiopods, like I said, they did real bad, but they do recover. Um, but it, it's just sort of another notch in their story of becoming more and more... I guess less and less diverse uh, and being slowly replaced by the bivalves. Uh, we see the trilobites also continue their much steeper decline. <laughs> uh, corals take a while, but they do come back. Um, not the, the same kinds per se. Um, those tabulate and, rugo and rugosin corals do make it through, but they take a big, big hit and are only for, around for not terribly long after this extinction. Um, on the positive side, seed plants become much, much more dominant. And basically, if you're thinking of a plant, it's a seed plant. <laughs> uh, basically, everything but ferns and mosses are seed plants. So those types of plants become much, much more common and dominant. Uh, sharks and the Actinopterygian fish, the raffin fish, uh, explode 
in their diversity in the early Carboniferous and become much more recognizable as what we would call sharks and fish today. And Pangaea becomes that much more closer to forming to be the, the superest of supercontinents. And that is the Devonian period. Very cool. All right, thank you. So with that done and out of the way, what do we have for Swamp Corner? Yeah, so uh, today in the Swamp Corner, um, I'm not going to do this justice because, you know, it's a plant. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I wanted to talk about the uh, Swamp Cypress. Uh, scientific name I'm going to butcher is Taxid Taxodium distichum. Um, crushed it. Thank you. <laughs> also called bald cypress, white cypress, tidewater red cypress, gulf cypress, or just red cypress. Um, they're deciduous conifers in the family Cupressaceae. Another one hard, but uh, Cu- uh Cupressaceae. Cooper Sacy. Okay, cool. I get confused with the C E A E. The uh, plants have family names different than animals do. So animal family names end in a day. A day. Yeah, I like that. Um, re- regardless of what kind of animal, everything from sponges to vertebrates, the families end in a day. Uh, whereas in plants, it ends in A C. Mm. No idea why, but fun fact. Nice. <laughs> uh, but. Deciduous meaning they lose their leaves, so uh, they are a type of conifer tree that lose their leaves at some point uh, and grow back. Uh, they are native throughout the southeastern United States. Um, they're really versatile in that they can grow in a bunch of different soil types, including wet, salty, dry, or swampy. Uh, there's a couple unique characteristics about cypress trees that I learned about when I moved down here, because I had no idea what a cypress tree was. (laughs) But uh, this thing called the cypress knee, which are basically these little, like, stumps that come out from the ground um, next to the trees that are, like, within the tree system. They're just, like, not directly touching the, um, the base of the tree, like, above ground. And, uh, no one really knows what exactly those knees do, but uh, some speculate that they help aerate the tree roots. And it kind of reminds me of, um, like, in mangroves, they have those um, where their roots mm-hmm. will come out, like, of the ground, and that, that is to help them breathe. So uh, they don't – they can't – I don't think anyone's really confirmed that that is exactly the same type of thing. But, um, yeah, cypresses have knees, and I've stubbed my uh, – toes on a lot of knees (laughs) Uh, also i just i love that they're called knees oh yeah yeah (laughs) and then this other word that i learned about um with cypress trees but i'm sure other uh types of trees do this as well it's called buttressing uh which is basically an enlargement at the base of uh, cypresses or other uh trees with root systems that basically make it more sturdy Buttressing is usually found uh, in plants that have really shallow root systems. Ooh, hello. So, sorry. It's okay. She got excited about buttressing. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's kind of just to make them more sturdy, help them uh, from falling over and dying uh, because their root systems are kind of shallow. Mm-hmm. Um, and this can kind of uh, get become more apparent um, when there's acting forces against uh, trees like tides or winds. Uh, Okay. So kind of like with what happens in hurricanes down here, um, the cypress trees are getting a lot of forces acted upon them. And so Mm -hmm. um, it's possible that they are getting thicker at the base uh, to try and help them bear against those forces. Um, Also, another fun fact, the bald cypress was designated the official state tree of Louisiana in 1963. Um, The cypress is uh, a really hot commodity because it's odorless, water resistant, and I've also heard bug resistant too, but I'm not sure how factual that part is. Um, So it was really big um, 
in the past. They did a lot of cypress logging in Louisiana, mm -hmm. but um, that was causing a lot of problems with like ecosystems and degrading of the coast. So uh, Louisiana banned uh, public land cypress logging, even though cool. I think it still happens. Uh, not publicly, but on private land. Um, let me look up something really quick, just because <laughs> yeah. it's slightly topical, because I I'm, might be confusing it with something else. Okay. Because <laughs> uh, I believe that uh, cypress mulch, or cypress like oh. chips, yeah. are very common. Oh, yeah, I was right. Are very common to use for like... Um, like the substrate, like the dirt, basically, in like reptile tanks? Oh, yeah. Maybe so, because like they are water resistant, so I guess it would help from getting moldy. Yeah, and I think I think that's a big part of what they're used for, is for yeah. like, like more tropical themes. So I, I know right. this because I, I have a pet reptile, for anybody who does not know. <laughs> um, but I was seeing, because I'm like, cypress mulch is familiar. <laughs> But I was yeah. using it with, uh, at first, pine chips, which are really bad. Pine is, for whatever reason, toxic to reptiles. Yeah. Well, isn't it also, um, like, produces sap? <laughs> yeah, it's the, um, wh whatever the chemical of pines that makes them smell piney is yeah. not good for reptiles. Um, yeah. But I was like, it's not is good that for me either. My... <laughs> I'm very allergic um, to pine. <laughs> Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Wow. Christmas must be a really hard time for you. Yeah, I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> Not Christmas, um, just the pine. Gotcha. Okay, but anyway. Well, th <laughs> yeah, no, thank you very much for uh, for Swamp Corner, Fia. And if, if Mike is still yeah. with us, uh, and also for Today I in History, I was, gonna thank, I was gonna thank Mike, but no, you did that too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, hopefully, Mike feels a little bit better. Uh, for next week and uh, with him gone I guess I'll take the outro here uh, thank you all for listening we will see you all next week with a brand new episode make sure to uh, check out some of those links down in the description and uh, have a great week everybody this episode of I Wish You Were Dead was written by Gavin Davidson and hosted by Gavin Davidson Mike Bryson and Fenella Campanino it was sound edited and edited for YouTube by Gavin Davidson Special thanks to former guests of the pod and to listeners like you.